Okay. Hi. Could you introduce yourself? I'm Stephanie Thomas. I'm the Vice President of Princeton Satellite Systems. Charles, I feel like you should introduce yourself too. My name is Charles Swanson. I'm a graduate student at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. What is the Princeton Satellite Systems? We're a small company, an aerospace technology company, and we do a lot of government research grants to sell commercial software for control of spacecraft. When were you founded? 1992. And sell the software? You make a lot of money doing that. Our software, I would say, is in a niche. We focus on spacecraft attitude control systems. It's a fairly small business, but we do have customers all around the world. And so we sell to research institutions and universities. A lot of countries are trying to get into the space business now. And so we do have a very interesting and diverse customer base. We do some consulting, sometimes for NASA and the European Space Agency, where we build them, you know, MATLAB models for their research work. Really cutting edge spacecraft control systems. What is a CubeSat? A CubeSat is a very small satellite, about the size of a grapefruit. So it's a new standard. It was developed at the university level with the idea that graduate students could build and launch these very small satellites quite inexpensively. And so now there's a whole set of standardized launch mechanisms. High school students have now built CubeSats. They can go up to the ISS. Government agencies and the big companies are also interested in building CubeSat. Many of them are doing imaging, but also the upper atmosphere. And, and now people are trying to send CubeSats to the moon. CubeSats to the moon, it feels <laughs> like a bit of a stretch. The biggest issue actually for a deep space CubeSat is now you need to be radiation hard. So now it's not cheap anymore. If you get out of low Earth orbit, you're in radiation, and your computer is going to be restarting itself every second. So your components will all fry. You're four days there, four days back, all in a high radiation environment. Everything has to be specially designed for radiation environment. So space is getting smaller and more compact. Your iPhone has all the subsystems that a satellite needs. So we're basically <laughs> iPhone and iPhone. Yes, there are people that want a, satellites. Are flying satellites that are basically a satellite on a chip. If satellites are going that direction, it seems to me that that would be a problem if you wanted to strap something like a fusion reactor. <laughs> well, there's different classes of missions. If you want to have a nice big laser in space, you need a lot of power for that. If you want to put humans on the moon and power their base, you need power for that. If you want to bring a whole lot of precious metals back from asteroids, that is not a small satellite. So there's still a lot of things in space we want to do that are big. That's a high power mission, and that's when you might need a fusion reactor. You are partnering with Sam Cohen at Princeton, correct? Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. How long right. have you guys been partnering? First paper that Mike Polushek, Sam did, it was in 1998. 1998. So they've known each other for quite some time. As Sam developed the PFRC, it became evident that the PFRC had interesting applications and then this unique propulsion application of using the entire reactor as a drive. What is the PFRC? Well, the PFRC is a really neat reactor concept. What does PFRC stand for? Princeton Field Reversed Configuration. Field Reversed Configuration is a category of magnetic confinement. How would you describe it to someone who didn't know anything about it? This is like a smaller ring of plasma that does the job of supporting itself rather than you having to support it. It's sort of a self-organized ring of plasma, and because of that, you can get away with having less stuff on the outside and it can be smaller. And the plasma spins in the center like a donut? A donut with no hole. A donut that you smush so that nothing can get through the hole. We have a little plasma fusion ball in the middle, and we have gas going around the outside. When you talk small, how small are we? It would fit in a minivan. A minivan. Yeah. All the magnets, all the plasma inside, and a good number of the supporting equipment would be minivan size. What would you need in supporting equipment? We need our thermal conversion systems. So we are going to have to take heat out of the reactor to make electricity. In space, we have all of our radiators, and we have to get rid of the excess heat. In space, we have our in-space startup system. We have our fuel tanks, fuel piping, and the neutral beams that actually introduce the fusion propellant into the inside of the reactor. Um, okay, so let's say I was an atom in the fuel system. What would my life be if I was going to go through the fusion reactor, get fused, and then get spit out the back? You well, come into the gas box, and you get ionized, and now you're a little ion. And you come out of the gas box and you're flowing along this envelope that runs around the reactor. 
Now your electron that got stripped off is also flowing with you, and that electron gets heated by the fusion product. Fusion products are coming and interacting with that electron, and that electron gets hot. We're inducing a current. So now my cold ion and my hot electron are coming up to the magnetic nozzle. Now we have a converging magnetic field, and some of that energy gets transferred from the electron, and its ion picks up kinetic energy. So it speeds up from the center of the reactor all the way through and out the magnetic nozzle. It's picking up speed, and it's going to exit at about 100 kilometers per second. 100 kilometers per second. Second. Per second. <laughs> So ions are shooting out the back. Our electrons are actually shooting out at the same speed, but they don't produce any thrust. They don't have any mass. They have very little mass. Now, if fusion happened and we have our proton and it shot right out of the reactor, it would have a speed of 25,000 kilometers per second. So you have to explain that, the difference between 25,000 and 100,000. So by having this interaction in the cool scrape-off layer, we figured out a way to transfer the energy from those fusion products to our gas, and now we're getting thrust, real thrust, meaningful thrust, 5 newtons, 10 newtons of thrust per megawatt of fusion power. That enables us to get somewhere. That's how we get to Pluto in four years. That's how we get to Mars in a few months. If you look at other fusion propulsion schemes, there are other schemes where they're maybe trying to channel those fusion products out the back of the reactor, but we figured out a very unique way to get a higher thrust so that is completely unique to our device. There's nothing else that operates this way. And is that because it's an FRC? That's because it's small and linear. Small means that the fusion products can traverse the machine. They can, they can get out and interact with this cold layer on the outside. And linear means that there's nothing in the way if it just wants to fly right at the end of the nozzle. So the PFRC would be different in that it would have active superconducting magnets along the length. If you look at other types of mirror machines that when you're on the ground, you're pumping vacuum out of them. You have two closed ends, but we open up that end and we let everything just go out the back. So it enables us to exhaust our fusion ash. So we're getting rid of our tritium. Our tritium, which is bad, both on the ground and in space, because it causes really high energy neutrons that destroy everything. We want to get rid of it. So the tritium can be exhausted in basically tens of milliseconds, where the burn-up time would be 20 seconds. Burn-up time high. would be 20 seconds, meaning what? The tritium would have to stay inside 20 seconds to fuse with the deuteron, which would produce that 14 MeV neutron. We don't want that because that destroys everything in its path. So if we get the tritium out in 20 milliseconds, basically we will have zero deuterium-tritium fusion in our machine. So we need this exhaust flow. It's our exhaust mechanism. And then we're piggybacking on it. And we can add some more gas to produce even more thrust. If you have a terrestrial engine, you would still have to be flowing gas through the scrape-off layer. But now you would have to extract energy out of it and recycle it. So you'd have a closed coolant loop. But in space, you know, it's just open. We just shoot everything out the back. That's one of the advantages of doing this in space. Are there other advantages to do this in space? So we don't do it in space because it's easier. It's still really hard to make something light enough for space. Our shielding has to be really thin and light. On the ground, we could just put more ceramic shielding. Who cares it's on the ground? The superconducting coils are not trivial to put in space. Our rate and conversion cycle has moving parts. Now it has to run for five years straight without stopping. So there's still a lot of complications with putting it in space. But there's nothing else that can do what this engine can do in space. Space is like a high value application that there's so many great things you can do with this reactor. So there's a good reason to invest in it. There's another good reason for space, which is planetary defense. There's actually very few technologies that could reach an asteroid in time. For a small enough asteroid, you could actually use the fusion reactor itself to change its orbit. You also deflect with a large laser system, but you still need to power their laser. So we're still talking about a space fusion reactor. The superconducting technology got to the point where we can work with it, where we can test it. Anyone who's ever gone into an MRI machine for a broken leg or to look at something weird in their abdomen or whatever, all of those MRIs are superconducting coils. We have our low temperature superconductors. For space, those would be considered pretty high ready list level. Low temperature superconductors are well understood, used in many applications, and there was a design for the ISS. They ended up having an issue, but there was a lot of development done for low temperature superconducting magnets for that space mission. All of that technology base is available. But if you look at high temperature superconductors, the technology is advancing very rapidly. 
there's not just a single high temperature material, there's multiple families of materials. There's metallic ones, there's ceramic ones. What's very interesting about them is you don't need to cool them to 4K. They become superconducting as high as 90 Kelvin, so that's liquid nitrogen. But now they have an entire operating regime between that, between 4 and 90 K. You can operate them at 20 K, at 30 K. And they're also more resistant to radiation damage. When Sam needed the high temperature superconductors, then he called up. And when he told them how much he needed, they sent it to him for free because it was such a small amount. So there are eight high temperature superconductor flux conservers. So they're what create the confinement and give us our FRC. And then we have the magnets that are producing the axial fielder at the ends. In space, we have this very interesting trade-off between the mass of our cooling equipment, which coolant we may choose, and what temperature we operate them at. So we're doing a research study. If I needed to build a space superconducting magnet now, which technology would I pick? And then where do we think in 10 years, how would we be building it? We feel it's more of an engineering challenge than a science challenge. You mentioned Brayton engine, and I have to ask what that is. So there are, are different technologies for getting electrical energy out of something hot, but in the Brayton cycle case, it's like a turbine, a gas turbine. There's spinning parts, there's blades, there's coolant flow, and you end up producing electricity. A Brayton engine is going to pull thermal energy out of a plasma and turn it into electrical energy. Technically, it's getting the energy out of the shielding. Our shielding is going to have the coolant running through it, so picture a layer of hot shielding. That's where we're sucking all the thermal power out. And then the superconducting coils are just past that. And they need to be at 20 Kelvin. So we have 10 centimeters to get a couple hundred kilowatts of power out. 20 Kelvin in space must be easy because everything's cold. Oh, but there's solar power. On satellites, our biggest problem is actually rejecting the heat. It's not easy because we're in space because all of our equipment are creating heat mm. and whatever you're using for a power source is going to have waste heat. And there's no air, so everything has to be by conductive cooling. Heat pipes and, and paths where things are all welded together with metal, you know, um, or radiative cooling. So portions of the outside of your spacecraft are what we call radiators and they have special coatings. Our best shielding materials to date are silver coated layers. They absorb 6% of it's either the IR or the UV. And that 6% is what killed the AMS, the superconducting magnets. I think they finally decided in the end analysis they weren't going to be able to keep them cold enough. There's another grant for a new type of solar shielding that would be a powdered shielding. And they now think that they could have a spherical shell in space, you know, with sun hitting it, mm. and what its heat temperature would be only 53 Kelvin. When I show a picture of our spacecraft, it has wings. And I tell people, those are not the solar panels. Those are our radiators. The only point of them is to ditch heat. Is to ditch heat. So we actually have to ditch a lot of heat because we have a fusion reactor. If you had a fusion reactor, you have to ditch even more heat. If if you have solar panels, 70% of the power that you're to solar panels, that has to be radiated. So thermal control on spacecraft is a huge issue. You have put forward a proposal to NASA for how much money? Our phase two NIAC is half a million dollars. Are you getting some of that money if you were to get that half million? We get it more in the form of services, analysis and things. Yeah, the lab is getting $150,000 of okay. the $500,000. Okay. And this is for the purpose of designing this next react. We're not designing PFRC3 yet. We're looking at our space subsystems, so at the superconducting coils. That's part of the money that you would get. You haven't won that money yet. No, we have it. Oh, you have it. It started in May. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, so phase two is ongoing. We're also going to be doing some experimental work on the machine, exploring the dynamics of the scrape-off layer and the thrust augmentation systems. There are valves available, a gas puff valve, and there's one in the middle of the machine, and they put in gas puffs, and they study the dynamics, and that's how they can tell that the FRC is being formed. But we want to put one in the gas box, and we're going to be puffing gas into it, and we're going to be seeing how it goes through our scrape-off layer take right. measurements and to make sure that the dynamics of the scrape-off layer are how they think we are. How thick is the scrape-off layer? How is the gas moving through it? And there is some heating from diffusion. So when we are pulsing the RF, 
I'm creating the FRC. There is heat being generated. So there's an experimental component. The lab will take data, we'll help analyze the data, and we're going to come back to our models of thrust and make sure our numerical simulations are all making sense. And we have a subcontract to a Dr. Minervini at MIT. We're working together with him on the superconducting design and the cryocoolers. We're talking about much bigger cryocoolers than have been used in space before. And we, we're going to make a video. We have a little documentary video, meet the team, and create some animations of the engine unit. So those things you learn in your first grant. Your second grant, you've now won, and congratulations. And you've applied for a phase three, yes? No, there's no phase three. There is no phase three. Okay. <laughs> What would a phase three be if it existed? How much money would that be? We I'd... estimate to really run the program to build the next machine, demonstrate fusion is $50 million. Is that what you think you need? Sure, yeah. To build a large CFRC that does fusion? Yes, it would still be a research. It wouldn't be an engineering prototype, but we would say, look, it made fusion. The goal would be 100 minutes of fusion at the end of its life. And so... you believe you can get 100 minutes of fusion? Yes. Yes. And yes. And this would be a scaled-up version of the FRC that exists now. The FRC that exists now has a radius of 8 centimeters. The next one we built, it was a radius of 16 to 20 centimeters. Twice as big, superconducting magnets. We believe we could produce fusion. And the 200 kilowatt power supply we have now is actually about what we would need. But the magnets, we have water-cooled copper magnets that are 40 years old. This machine has been cobbled together a shoestring budget because it's reusing pieces from other projects all over the lab. So for somebody to replicate the machine we have now would still be like a $5 million endeavor. So this next machine, that's a jumping off point to a space engine. That's right. Like two test beds, actually. So you want to do two projects in parallel. You want to do the fusion piece, and then you want to do the heat piece. That's exactly right. And the heat piece involves the Brighton engine for collecting the energy. It involves the radiation. Well, you're going to have to do something with that waste heat. And it involves the incorporation of superconducting magnets, which you're not really doing now. You're kind of doing it, but you're not really doing it. That's right. So you've got this magnetic nozzle, and that's going to create your thrust. And you said five yes. newtons. How does that compare against the traditional Hall thruster? Hall thrusters engine? could be in the millinewton fraction of newton range. Like a thousand times smaller, roughly? Yeah. I mean, there are bigger Hall thrusters that might cobble together a fraction of a newton. So what you've described is something that fits in a minivan. It's a thousand times better than typical engines. It has heating coils. It has a Brighton engine. It has heat exhaust system. How long do you think it would take to develop all that if you had the funding today? My most optimistic estimate was 15 years. If we look at all these subsystems that we're talking about, everything's coming along. Even these radiators, NASA's worked on these carbon-carbon radiators. The superconductors are there. Brighton engine is known technology. We need to design a big enough one for space purposes. That's why we're so excited about this, because you look at all the different component technologies we need, and you can find a path to getting that technology into space pretty much every subsystem we've looked at. So I would point out there are other fusion propulsion concepts that require a fission reactor just to start them up. There's another NIAC grant. It's a lithium liner fusion concept. And oh, by the way, they need a fission reactor to start it up. That's not trivial. So our reactor would only need a few hundred kilowatts start. to start up. Uh, you can do that with just a couple kilograms of oxygen and some of the deuterium we have in our deuterium tank. Our current target power range is 1 to 10 megawatts. People say, megawatts. can you scale it up? And I say, no. It has to be this certain physical size. And that has to do with the gyro radius of the fusion product. They have a certain orbit. And it's so many centimeters. And mm -hmm. they need to interact with this cold scrape-off layer because that's how we get rid of it. If you look at our engines, basically there's a certain physical process taking place and there's optimal size. It's the same thing with this particular fusion reactor. There is a physical sweet spot that is dictated by the physics. Would you agree with this engine being sort of an operating space kind of thing? Yes. Sometimes we like to play with the idea of a higher field and a denser reactor, but it just isn't as good. There really is quite a narrow sweet spot for this thing. So if you want more power and you need more engines, you would picture on a manned mission to Mars, you would have an array of FRCs. So if one were to go down, you would have some redundancy. So mm -hmm. we're looking at Mars missions with maybe six direct fusion drives. 
you said 25 centimeters. I'm imagining something the size of a microwave. That's where the fusion is taking place. So yeah, it's a little microwave suspended in your minivan. So it's a microwave <laughs> suspended in a minivan. And you don't see brick walls. You see pathways through all these different component technologies to the thing you want to build. Right. So the problem is just fitting it all together. We still have to demonstrate fusion. We have a machine, it's heating <clears> plasma, <throat> but it's not producing fusion, and we're still an order of magnitude away from doing that. FRCs have produced fusion, correct? Tri-Alpha's FRC produces what's called beam target fusion. It's not a fusion of the kind that scales into a usable limit. The liner implosion people, I believe, there is a little FRC in there, but they're squishing it with a liner. It's produced fusion. You primarily go through NASA, correct? We have succeeded in getting NASA's interests in this project. For Princeton satellite systems, we have really spanned the range of Air Force, Navy, Army, and NASA over the years. Are those funding sources continuing or drying up? These SBIRs are like these small modular grants. So we had several SBIRs with the Air Force, but the program direction changed right, away from our technology. Why was that? That was a case where they decided they wanted to port all the legacy software and they weren't interested in anything new. We had a similar problem with the Navy and they had a variety of SBIRs they were supporting. As long as the program was in its research phase, SBIRs are 3% of every department's research budget. Once they switched to operational phase, there was no more money for any of the research. It's true throughout research. It's pretty easy to get a little seed money to work on your concept, but it's very hard to get the money you need to finish your product, to get your product ready for the shelves, to you know, build a fusion reactor that can actually produce fusion, whatever the example is. So now we've gotten some seed money to develop our idea. But you're afraid the same thing will happen again, aren't you? So, as I said, we're started our phase two. In the summer, we have the opportunity to have a midterm review, and that's when the program will try to connect us with people within NASA who may be interested in continuing to fund this. But we're also trying to use this to attract interest from groups in the military, forward power, emergency power, mobile power. So what do you encounter when you talk to people about this? With investors, the biggest issue is they want something in three years. If I give you some money, how can you break it up into little chunks? There's a limit to what we can do in three years. But do we think we can do it in seven years? Yes. We have a path. We understand the technology we need to put together and we can get the right team together. We think that's a reasonable time frame. Charles, you're a grad student, yeah? Yes. You're graduating when? Targeting April. Targeting April. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone hates that question. Yeah. Would you work on something like this? If there was a job available for you, would you take it? Yes. But do you think that there is a job available? It's not obvious yet. Not it obvious. It very much depends on the next few months. You are a clear example of someone who would do this work, but she needs the money to make this a reality. But my biggest problem with investors is they want it too soon. One investor asked me, could we come up with milestones and assign a percentage likelihood? If you give me $5 million, can we demonstrate ions to 1,000 EV? I think we can assign a confidence level to that. We're fairly confident we can heat ions to 1,000 EV, and then can we go from there to 100K EVs? Investors want things fast. This is not a dot-com startup. We're not a guarantee of success. We think a biotech is a better analogy. If you're developing a drug, they invest in a lot of drugs that don't pan out. That's a good analogy. In a perfect world, what would happen? Would you get your funding from the government or would you go through a private investor? What would be a good fit? From an IP perspective, money from the government might be better. We're pretty good at managing government grants. We've managed grants up to about a million dollars. If we go the private investment round, you'd be giving away equity, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So it's sort of going another order of magnitude for us. We would need manager types. Our team would have to include people with the management expertise and the legal expertise to handle that. As an American, I see a lot of uses for this, for our country and for our security and for the military. And I would like to see us have that technology available. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of this interview. Is there any work that's going on right now that you want to promote? There's a lot of interest in interstellar travel <laughs> right now. We were interviewed for a documentary on interstellar travel, and they were very excited about our machine because everything they had was CGI and there was no hardware. So we had a machine that's actually heating plasma, and we have this path for our fusion engines. 
But there's a more near-term mission. They call it the gravity lens. And the gravity lens mission, you need to get to 550 to 650 AU. So this is well outside Pluto. Pluto is about 40 AU. All right, so it's like 10 times the distance of Pluto. And then you need to come back and you're looking around the sun and you can image exoplanets. So it's pretty much a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you're at some distance 650 AU, there's like sort of a solar system with exoplanets that you can see. And it might take a year to fully image the exoplanet because you're building up pixels as the exoplanet's going around its sun. But we can get there in 10 to 15 years. They're looking at slingshotting around the sun and slingshotting around Jupiter. And we can go there and we can stop and stay there and take pictures of exoplanets for five years. So this is an exciting mission that the planetary scientists are thinking about now. And we want to come to them and say, hey, think about your mission with a fusion reactor. How would it be better? Because now we can slow down and stop instead of careening on at however many kilometers per second. So that's an exciting little piece of science. The more meetings we go to and the more we talk about this with scientists, the more ideas there are for missions that could take advantage of it. We've come to the end of the interview. Do you have anything more to add? Yeah. key thing about our machine, it's really simple compared to other fusion machines. We have an array of magnets, single array, oil magnets, put gas down the middle, radio frequency power. There's no complicated magnet. There's no metal liners shooting out the back. It's really simple, it's really small, and that's why we think we can develop it in this time frame and for this amount of money. And mm -hmm. that's why people will say, I've seen a lot of fusion concepts, but this one seems to me the one that has potential to work. This is actually the fifth version of this machine. There was a PFRC1 ABCD. He was able to demonstrate heating electrons using this method for the very first time in that machine. So it is the fifth generation machine already. It says it was small, and we've been able to make the progress we have for a remarkably small budget. Charles, do you have more to add? Because you really didn't get to talk much. It wasn't my interview. That's true. All right, I think that 